My name is Charles L. Forrest, and I'm a resident of Matthews County. I was born and raised here. I work on on the water. And several, my daddy was a pound that fisherman. I started working with him, and uh, I done some of the little haul net sand and sand. Hudging, then I went fishing on a fish. I went been two years in the military, Germany, and after that I came home. I got a job on a fishing vessel, Captain Harry Austin. I, I stayed with him eight years, I believe it was, in Atlantic City, New Jersey. We worked out of Tucker, out in New Jersey. Now after that, he the, the fish start playing out up on the up on the East Coast there. About what year was that? Uh, 1964, 64, 64, 64. 19, 54 when I first started with Harry Austin, 1954. And uh, with him for six, seven, eight years, and Paul Hudson took over in 19, I don't know if it was 62 or what. Then I went with Joe Goodwin of the North Carolina. He, he came up here and got a boat up here in the beach coma. Stayed with him and then fishing played out we, and they sent us down Louis down uh, Mr. Smith bought a plant down there and uh, and then me and I went out and met Joe Goodman on a boat sicky on us at a converted boat that we went out on that she was a kind of deep draft boat but we had a fair season down there stayed down there with him until he uh, he uh, Got a job in Mississippi. I didn't want to go to Mississippi, Moss Point, so I remember they kept Robert Roland Hudson. Mm -hmm. I stayed on there, yeah, then uh Harvey Smith called me, wanted me to go fish for him, asked me to fish one of his boat, but at the same time I've been trying to get one with, with Older Smith, his brother. So, and I signed up with Mr. Older Smith in nineteen sixty eight. On the boat Tangible Hoar. I, I can't hardly bear the name. But <laughs> she was on a converted boat. Everything was just obvious on it, and uh, it was on these new vessels and things they got now. Yeah. You say a converted boat, what? A converted minesweeper? Yeah, she was old minesweeper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and they had converted her. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I took her, I couldn't hardly get a crew for that, so they had to change name, put a new name, it wasn't name or, uh, what was the first name, was it? Uh, Skate, I think it was, Skate. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't get a crew going, so uh, I left home that year, I got, he gave me that boat, and the name of Tanya, behold, I had six men from here, and I picked the rest of them up. Of oh, the cornfield, of oh, the uh, sugarcane field down there in Louisiana, Abbeville. Mm -hmm. And we made a season down there in Abbeville. That was 1968. We had uh, 22 million of fish. And a lot of guys had 40, 50, and some of them had 45, like that. And uh, so she went, she went pieces. Mm -hmm. And in the fall of 68, that's where we get into. They give me a boat in Louisiana, and that's just Fenric Garland. Mm -hmm. we, we, I got a crew of men from here. And went to Fenric Island, no, Fenric Island to Buford, North Carolina. Yeah. We were doing real good. In, uh, and one afternoon, we, Saturday afternoon, we started on, we had all we needed at the time because we had a way to run. And we started back to the plant, and the, and the storm started coming up.
According to the Marine Casualty Report issued by the U.S. Coast Guard Board of Investigations, on or about 11.30 p.m. on the night of December 7, 1968, the fishing vessel Fenwick Island sank in 47 feet of water in the Atlantic Ocean off Cape Lookout, North Carolina, after capsizing in heavy seas. Seven lives of the 14-member crew were lost due to exposure. The vessel was not recovered. As the 130-foot steel hull fishing vessel was returning to the port of Beaufort, North Carolina, laden with a cargo of Menhaden, she encountered unexpected heavy weather and took water on in her main fish hold. There were eight trimming ports, each about 18 inches in diameter, on the main deck. The cover was not in place in one of these ports, and the water initially entered the hold through this port and later through the main hatch itself, which was also not covered. Although the hatch cover was available, this type of vessel normally engaged in fishing in good weather, so it was the general practice to operate the main hatch open. The vessel capsized and lay on her port side for 30 to 45 minutes before sinking. The seven survivors were rescued within one hour of the sinking by the W.T. James, Jr. Besides the rescue of the seven survivors by the W.T. James, they also recovered one of the seven bodies. The other six were recovered the following day, some distance from the sinking, by spotter pilot David Haney, who guided the Coast Guard to the recovery area. The final Coast Guard report found no evidence of misconduct, negligence, inattention to duty, or incompetence warranting further action. Others were out fishing in the area on that night, and as the bad weather came up so rapidly, they struggled to maintain control of their boats and make it into port. One of these was longtime Menhaden fisherman Captain Meredith Robbins, who talked about that night in a 2005 interview for the Reedville Fisherman's Museum Oral History Project. We went to uh, went fishing down there. That was the night uh, we 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 caught in we got caught in a bad storm. Uh, we had been fishing up around Ocracoke and. Uh, some of the boats were as far north as Hatteras. And we had a, what we always feared the most was a cold front come through. And it blew up to 80 miles an hour that night. But we were very fortunate. We had gotten close enough to Beaufort Bar that uh, we had several boats to get in trouble. We had one boat to capsize, but uh, but the, oh, I was on the Dunton that fall, I'll never forget it. And uh, we had a terrible night, and uh, uh, but we managed to get in, and uh, the next morning, I'll never forget, uh, they said that there was seven or eight men, crew, mem crew members missing on one of the boats, the Fenwick Island. So they, their airplanes were off real early looking for the survivors, but they found that uh, exposure had, uh, had, had got the best out of them. Then Standard had a boat that was out there drifting around, but it managed to, to su uh, survive the storm, and the Coast Guard picked it up next morning. The pilot aboard the Fenwick Island that night was Charles Robertson Winstead, Jr. He began his fishing career back in 1930 and through the years had held positions as pilot, mate, and captain. Here are his remembrances of the night of December 7, 1968, as recounted during a 2005 interview for the Reedville Fisherman's Museum Oral History Project. You were on the Fenwick Island when she sunk, were you? That's right. I pile it on her. Would you care to talk about it or rather not? What, the Phoenix Island? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, she's. That was a. I believe the roughest night. It looked like to me it wasn't the biggest sea, but it was the roughest night I've ever spent on it. We were working up southeast of Hatteras. Any size bunch of fish you want. 
But the plane was setting him, and they set him too close, and he stabbed two, three times. Pretty soon, Bill Schaefer come in and dropped him off on two places, and they loaded him. Well, them great big sets, and the pumping, the fish pile up. They don't spread like they ought to. And they kept pumping, kept pumping. Naturally, that's, they're trying to load. That's all they could do, keep pumping. And they got him in that hole, but not spread out. And we got in that rough sea, she shifted the load. Port side went right over in the water. He couldn't get it back. Well, there was no hope for them. I tried to get him to send a boat alongside and put, give me a gun line, take crew off her. But everybody else was having such a rough time. It was the roughest night, it was the worst night that had ever been known in fish business. Smith's boats were late getting there or something. They didn't load as early as the other boats. So the wind struck them east the lookout. I told the captain, I said, you, don't you go off uh, tonight. Don't go down that show with them boats. I said, when you get your boats up, drive to the beach as hard as you can. He said, well, Captain, I thought the others can go. I thought we can go. I said, don't pay no attention to the others. But it's going to blow a gale of wind at night. Don't you go off that show because somebody will get in trouble. So I went down. I was going to cut a few fish. But that, I felt that breeze. How come, how I knew it was going to blow? I've been working on that coast quite a number of years. And I felt that warm southern breeze about 2 o'clock at evening. I said, it's going to blow southwest night. I told them before they stop fishing. I said, it's going to blow a gale wind night. You better make arrangements to get somewhere. It wasn't blowing as hard as I've seen it. And you said the sea wasn't so big. But it was everywhere. Mm -hmm. There was no getting there to do it. There was a northwest wind, a southwest sea. There was a <coughs> heavy swell from offshore. And everywhere you turn was head on. No way. Uh, everywhere you turn to see was just one of those. No way of getting to the lead, lead side of it. Rough everywhere you turned. That sea had a cap on it, and everywhere you, the water just was just capping and blowing everywhere. I mean, it almost drowned you to look the wind. I never saw nothing like that. I'm, I'm, anybody was out there that night will tell you it was a rough night. But we, we don't, we don't move, God. we shift the fish, we got lost. And we were just about around the beacon when she shift the fish. We just about come around the boat, we were about three miles northwest of that buoy when she shift the fish. Well, it wasn't too late then, there wasn't nothing you could do. Every boat out there was in trouble that night, except Captain Ernest Lena and But Captain Ernest was, <coughs> he was right well behind us. When he come around, we were right in line. He had to come around and knuckle. And then he, he was close enough to hear the men hollering. That's how I come him to know he was in the neighborhood. Now he knew it had been on the air that Phoenix Howe was in trouble sometime before that. Now, <coughs> uh, we didn't have There was some things that could have been done, maybe. But it wasn't much you could do, because that water, 
if that water kept blowing over, kept blowing over, the water got in a hole there. And then slushing from side to side, that's, that shifted the fish. Well, see, there's so much, the fish piled up, coming out to pump. They come out dry, they pile up in one place. But when that water, and they happened to go to the loot, to the port side, and that, well, nothing you could do with it then. But you know, I capitalized on the situation. But my, f my friend was long, my captain was alongside of me. The several of them hollering. I said, you stop, you don't do that. I said, if you, you'll be exhausted and you won't have a chance. But that's how we got saved. The Captain Ernest heard them other fellows hollering and he picked up some of them. And after he found, first one he picked up, he found out what boat they were off. And then he kept looking, he threw the searchlight around until he picked up what he could pick up of. When he come beside me, somebody on the deck said, Lord, that's Captain Charlie. And this fellow said, Captain Charlie, can you catch a line? I said, yeah, I can catch a line. I held my hand in the air like that. He threw that line just as plumb between my full finger and thumbs. You could have shot it with a gun line. I caught it, and I started overhand some slack. I was going to throw it to the cabin, but somebody off the boat throwed him one by the time I got mine. And then they... <coughs> They all, then the four or five hit them, grabbed that line, and they pulled. I said, don't y'all, y'all can't pull me out the water. I said, walk back aft. And, well, I can get hold of the rail, I can pull myself out of but you can't pull me out the water. But Captain Ernest, Captain Olin, Olin, yeah, Olin, Olin was mate with him. He run and grabbed the ladder and throw it over, tied it in the rigging and throw it overboard. And I come up the ladder. But didn't nobody know, I weighed 335, 40 pounds then. I don't think I ever went to 40, but I know I weighed over 335. I know you frightened old Oldham so bad, he never went aboard a boat again. Who? Uh, Oldham Delaney, I said, he, he was frightened so bad, he never went aboard another boat. Never went aboard another one. Well, he, he was, he was in better, better shape than anybody. He picked us up. He the only man that would have done that. The rest of them were right by us, but he didn't pay no attention to us. <clears throat> but he come there and picked, he picked up seven of the crew, because 14 of them board there. He picked up seven. Two, two of them, one, was already drowned when they got him. It, they took hook, got him on deck. And the others, they brought him in to the hotel, I mean to the hospital. And the plane found the rest of them the next month. They, they were floating, they had the life as I was on, they were floating. One fellow, was standing on the deck, as close to me as I am, Mr. George, or closer. And asked me, must have jumped overboard with his foot foremost. Well, I didn't say anything, because I, I, I didn't think I had a little sense not to jump overboard. I turned my head, and he, look, he was gone. And he, <clears throat> When it struck the water, he said, Lord, have mercy. It went right down underneath him, and the wheel struck him and killed him. He didn't, he didn't never sink. Wheel struck him and killed him. He won't breathe and then, so he didn't get the water in him. They found him next morning with his life preserver cut off him, but he's still floating. 
and he asked me, must he jump overboard foot foremost? Some of the rest of them had jumped overboard. The mate and some of them had jumped overboard thinking they could swim somewhere. They couldn't, you just well be playing with your toes to try to swim that night. A man said to me, let's swim to the boat. I said, you better use what strength you got to keep, <coughs> keep still. <laughs> you can't swim nowhere now. I said, that boat's picking them up fast as he can. If he finds you, if he gets a light on you, he finds you, you will be saved. If you don't, it will be gone. That's all. I said, but you can't swim no well. You need to forget about that. <coughs> Herman Tan Scott was a crewman aboard the W.T. James Jr. when they rescued the survivors of the Fenwick Island. He describes that night during a November 2014 interview. So all, all this happened, this rescue and all the sinking and the rescue, all happened right around the knuckle, didn't it? Mm-hmm. Just before you got the knuckle. They didn't get around it before so you, he got there. So you have to make a turn around the knuckle. knuckle to go to the factory. And I guess so you, when you got to the knuckle, you could make a turn and head for the lighthouse. Yeah. Is that right? Yep. And that would take you right on if, into both. Yeah. If you make it around Knuckle, <laughs> that was a bad place. Knuckle and Hatteras. There's two places when you leave. You can make it around Knuckle Boy, you got it made. If you can make it around Hatteras, you got it made. Because one, because the seas are running both ways. So you got to see meeting each other at, fo at four. North, east, south, west. They meet still. They really see you meet there. Does the same thing happen at Hatteras? Hatteras the same way. Huh. So here you had the worst night in your life. <laughs> uh, the worst wind, the worst seas, at the worst place. I ain't gonna say I had the worst life, but you know, that was the first time that I, that ain't first, that was the first time I've been on that boat sunk. This boat sinking. Yeah, yeah. So Ernest came down, and what did he say? He called everybody, when he came down, he called everybody on deck and told them the boat was sinking. Our boat was sinking. So everybody come up. By the time everybody got on deck, the boat was gone. When they were on top of water, they were fish. So all you could see was fish. Could you see any of the Fenwick Island? We, no. It, it turned over at that time, right? She had gone. Gone completely? Yep. She had gone with me if I got on deck. So he must, he, uh, Ernest and uh, Oldham and, and the pilot and all, they, they had really gotten to the to the place where the uh, the men were in the water oh, before, they before they called oh, yeah. the guys up on deck to yeah. help get them out. Yeah. Wow. Yep, because everybody was on deck. So Clarence yeah. Meany says he, he got knocked down by a wave and almost went overboard himself. I guess he was on one side of the boat and I he was on the other. So he had him on each side of the boat. Okay. See, some was on one side and some was on the other. Dude mm -hmm. picked the men up from both sides. So did, but did you have to reach down and grab oh, some, yeah. some of them and yep. help pull them up, help them get yep, up on the deck? Yep, they had men doing that too. Uh -huh. They had men had rope tied around the waist and tied to the rail of the boat. Grab them when they come in with a hook. And just, and just pull them up. Just pull them up. Yep. Just land them. The suction from the boat held them to the boat. We didn't wash them away. Right. But the suction from the boat held them to the boat. Do you think any of them drowned because of that? Mm, no, they were already dead. They had some, they wanted to suck. One day we picked up, with, they was already dead. They died from the water. I, th I think they died from own. Um, I believe. I believe they died from you know like s suffocate or the cold water. Yeah. Tall them seas were they wouldn't help it. What you say? Tall them seas were that day you couldn't help it. That night. <coughs> so um, I think it was Ernest mentioned in one of his interviews that we have a video of. That he happened to have a ladder. Yep, downside the boat. 
We, but they only had one ladder. Oh, how many ladders they had? I know they had a ladder on both sides. They had a ladder on both sides? Yeah. See, they would pick the men up from both sides. Not one side, both sides. Uh-huh. Wow. Well, you could hear them. You could hear them holler, like from you over to that house. And some behind you, some beside you. Holler. Some of them loaded with fish. Fish covered them up. They found, I think they found the rest of them that morning. Yeah, that's right. Coast Guard got the rest of them. Yeah. But y'all got all the men you could find. Got all the have seen. That you've seen, yeah. Yeah. When did the, and when you were going in, uh, in the boat, when did the war, when did it start to calm down? When did you, you know, when did you lose those, those terrible high waves and stuff? If we got in, and if we got around the boat, around the sucking buoy, if we got around, if we got around knuckle, if we got around knuckle, we all, we didn't go around knuckle. We came on the inside of knuckle. It wasn't that bad. Uh huh. That was a little closer to the to, to the, the beach. beach yeah. Uh huh. But you had to be careful come around there. Wow. But he show. Uh -huh. You got shower water through there. Yeah. Uh -huh. We've heard that uh, uh, there were other boats in the neighborhood there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, but y'all, James, y'all were the only one that went to went to, to try help. to save somebody. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So did you see these other fish boats around you? See them going in. They were just, all those boats that uh, dock tied up, but they said they wasn't coming back over there. They didn't come back either. And I don't follow them either. You don't fault them? No. I'm going to leave the dock and come back over there rough as it was? Yeah. Huh. You know, sometimes I'll talk to my friends about things that uh, we didn't do or things that we shouldn't have done and something like that. And, you know, lots of times when you're talking about something like that, do you, you know, you sometimes end up talking about, was there anything you could have done to save To save the boat? Yeah. Nope. Anything, do you think you could have gotten, saved any more of those people in the water? No, I didn't. I don't think so. Ernest Delano was captain of the W.T. James, Jr. that came to the rescue of the Fenwick Island. His younger brother, Oldham, was the mate on the James. In his written statement to the Coast Guard Board of Investigation, Captain Delano stated that at about 4.45 p.m. on December 7th, he terminated his fishing activity about seven miles south of Cape Hatteras and headed for port at the Beaufort Bar. Around 6 p.m. he heard a radio weather report of a front moving into the area causing winds to shift. This front came through about 9 p.m. with winds coming out of the northwest at 60 knots or better. As the James moved into the vicinity of the knuckle buoy, Captain Delano came upon and rendered assistance to the Eamon Dutton, Captain by Meredith Robbins. The Dutton had a full load of fish and was taking seas pretty heavily. At that point, Captain Delano heard on the radio that the Fenwick Island was in trouble about two and a half miles south of the James. Here, in his own words, is Captain Ernest Delano's description of that night from a 2005 interview. What year was it that the uh, Fenwick Island sank? That was in 68. So, you remember that pretty vividly, don't you? Uh, yeah, I remember that, that pretty well. You mind yeah. talking about it? No. Uh, I was late getting my fish out that day. I was, and I got up to Ocracoke. 
that was the closest fish about uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. And the playing man <coughs> set man, I caught about three, three fifty the first set. And by the time I finished that one, because fall the year like that, it gets dark early. And he said, I got another one on Camp Ernest. It's five or six miles up here. I said, I don't know where you can make it for dark or before I have to leave or not. I said, well, we'll try. But I did get to it, and I got somewhere basically the same amount that set. And uh, while I was pumping, because it was dark then, while I was pumping those, one of the boats called me from down Lookout, Cape Lookout, and it says, uh, Ernest, it's breezing up down here real fast. And uh, the water was just as slick up there as that floor. And I said, okay. so. Finished pumping out coal that my brother was made with me. And uh, I says, put all everything on the purse boats. We had cables with turnbuckles for storms and stuff that we put on a purse boat and Oops. Did you hook them to the side of the after house for the hold them. Keep going. And uh, we did that and start, kept on down towards Lookout. And of course, I heard the other boats talking about how bad it was getting. And I guess I was about halfway to Lookout when the Southwester hit me. And it was blowing, I guess. 25 ready to start. And uh, by the time I got out, out close to look out, about 40 miles now, I would say, which was awful rough. And Bertus Robbins was in there, Ammon Dutton, one of the Mississippi boats owned by Haney. And he was having trouble with his purse boats working loose. And I come up on him and I tried to knock the sea off him. And she looked like a log in the water, the sea's breaking over. And the way uh, I told him, I said, you got to get that boat around here to it. And just about that time, it come out northwest about seventy five. And what are the how high are the seas? I I don't know. Twenty foot I guess. I know they were they were breaking over top of the, the James and hitting the Paltos at times right hard. And I was only a little over half loaded. Anyway, I saw this boat below me, about two miles, a little over two miles. In fact, I think it was two and a half on, actually on the radar. Uh, and his lights went out. And I knew he was in trouble. Oh, I told Murdoch that Murdoch had gotten turned around and gotten going again. And I told him, I said, I'm going to him. So I speeded her up a little bit. That didn't work. I had to slow back down. But anyway, I got down to him. And the first thing I saw was the bottom. I lost on radar just a few minutes before. I guess that was when she turned over. But anyway, the bottom of her. The first thing I saw, I picked that up with a spotlight. And I was afraid to go right to her because I didn't know where the net was. And 
nothing for I suppose. So I went around to the north side where I knew I'd be in the clear. And I come to the fish and it, she was loaded, was on top of the water. So I run right up to the line of fish and that's when I picked up the men in the water. So we got seven live, one body, and that was all I could find. And I, I found out after I got those aboard and talked to some of them that the others had jumped overboard earlier. The reason they weren't with the ones that I was rescued. So the ones you rescued had stayed on the boat? Stayed on until she turned over. And crawled up on the bottom of her, so they said. But they were on the opposite side from where I was when I showed the light on her. But when I got around to where the men were, she was gone. How did you pick them up? Donald, I was fortunate enough that I had put a ladder aboard the James. She was kind of high-sided to have when it went into docks, different places to get off and on. And we had the ladder down the forward hole where the water tank was. It was a 12-foot ladder. And we got that. And some of them could climb up the ladder, and the ones that couldn't would just hold on, we'd pull the ladder up. Or they had to go down and get one. One man would, he was so far gone, he would catch hold. Did you know any of the men? Yes, ma'am. But I know you know Charlie Winston. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I knew Charlie and I knew uh, the engineer. Uh, he lives down here at Block Point. I have trouble with names. But, but it's he, a good thing you were yes. there and had a ladder and were willing to help. Yeah, well, gosh, I was the only one in the area that could help, real and truly. It was the only boat. Everybody else had all they could take care of to themselves. When you were rescuing these men, was it still 75 miles an hour and 20 foot waves? No, it had dropped down to, I would say 50 or 60. <laughs> Oldham never fished after that, did he? Yeah, Oldham fished after that. Did he? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, he fished he fished with me on Northumberland. Okay. Yeah. He he was pilot with me, mate with me both after that. Who was pilot with you when uh you picked up these people? Charlie Robson. What do you think it could have prevented it from happening? How's that? Why I mean <clears throat> what could they they have done to prevented it from happening. Because they had other boats just like it in the area, didn't they? Yeah. Uh, Donald, I don't really and truly know not being yeah. right there. I think maybe it's a possibility of something that the, didn't do earlier, might have caused it or something, but I, I don't know. Well, when you don't know unless yeah. you're yeah. seeing things, and sometimes you don't know then. That's right. Did you get a plaque, life saving plaque, for doing that? Uh, yes. I got a plaque from the Coast Guard. It's okay, I'll get it. There. And they put the plaque on the boat, and that's up there on the wall. So you took the seven people 
in to Reedville? No, I took them to, uh, to Moorhead City. To where? Moorhead City. Okay. Yeah. Our plant was in Moorhead, and uh, but I went, they had a shipping dock at Moorhead where ships came in, and I went to Rescue Squad, met me right there at the shipping dock, and took them off and get them all up to the hospital. Did you have any other weather comparable to the 75 mile? No, never. That was the worst you've uh, ever seen? That was the worst weather. Only, only other worst weather time it, I was over in, there was on a ship coming from Europe. I come, come in a hurricane, 93. That was that was a rough time too. As noted earlier, the following morning David Haney, a Manhattan spotter pilot working out of Beaufort at the time, was instrumental in the discovery of the remaining six bodies and guiding the Coast Guard to the recovery site. How did you uh, how did you first find out about the sinking? Uh, well we knew about it that night. Okay, on the on the night of the seventh. Uh, well, it, it couldn't have been any more than an hour after it went down, and we knew that Ernest was out there trying to rescue somebody, and that was, you know, sometime during that night. And then mm -hmm. we all got up early and ate breakfast at the um, the, the restaurant at the end of the airfield. Well, where were you at the time? In Beaufort. In Beaufort. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At the, the Beaufort Airport, and uh, we stayed in a motel right across the street from it. Mm -hmm. Of course, that was the breakfast topic of conversation. Yeah, were you were you regularly flying out of Beaufort Airport at the time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because it was the fall season, all the boats were fishing out of Beaufort. Mm -hmm. It was one, two, three, four, five, five factors out then. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many people took off that day. Probably. 10, 15 of us were flying down at the time. And uh, we, we knew a boat where the Fenwick Island went down. Fish leave a slick. And I just looked for the slick on the water, and it was rough, and you could determine the, the, the sheen on the water and then go downwind from there. Because mm -hmm. they'll go the same way that people drift or bite it or anything would drift. So I just went, saw the slick and followed it downwind. And you see little orange blobs floating on the water. Was the weather bad still that morning? Yes. It was, it wasn't fishable. The boat's all at the dock, I believe. And, but the planes always flew every morning anyway. The, to try to track the fish from the day before. Um, and we knew a Coast Guard plane was out there looking in a, in a Coast Guard boat. And we couldn't communicate directly to the boat, but we could talk to the Coast Guard airplane. The Fenwick Island was at the knuckle. The Fenwick Island went down at the knuckle and the bodies were found about right over in here. Wow. Yeah. So uh, they it took us a long way. Really? Yeah. Well, it was blowing a gale that night, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. it did. Well, Most of the boats, they called it laying up under the knuckle on they, they were coming down the beach and they were loaded. The, and they all went in here along the edge of the beach till mm -hmm. the winds moderated because it was a southwest wind Yeah. that yeah. night. Now, now that but I the got current the, comes down the beach yeah. at that time. Now that I got the camera on it, could you circle around again where you found the bodies? The bodies were found roughly in this vicinity. Okay. But, uh, again, this is 50 years ago, so I don't recall exactly, but yeah. I know I, that we were on the west side of the knuckle. On the other side the, of the knuckle, A yeah. lookout shoal, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In fact, the knuckle goes from here on out. Yeah. Oh, about out to here, and the, the bodies were probably way over here. 
Mm -hmm. so how that. hard was it to see those life jackets? It, it's not not that difficult. Really? It's just a little pinprick when you you know three quarters of a mile high, so you're three quarters of a mile away to see a life jacket, but it's orange compared to a a white and green sea. Uh -huh. You know, because white white's awfully hard to find. Yeah. Because of white caps, but the orange sits out. Were they grouped? No. They spread out pretty they, they had not attached each other by a line or anything. They were spread out like from the first one, the rest of them were helter skelter like your fingers would point out. But I don't recall too much about it other than we kept, I kept telling the Coast Guard plane to tell the, the, the cutter there's some more bodies over here that they hadn't seen or gone to. And, uh, I don't know how long it took to relay all that, but they kept saying, do you see any other bodies? And I'd say, nope, I don't see anything else. And I've been flying around the whole time they were retrieving them. Mm -hmm. So you just figured that they were downwind of the slip. Yeah, that time, the, the wind, I think the night before was north, I mean, it was southwest. That's where our bad weather would come from when you're fishing in Carolina. It comes from the south, from the southwest. And um, the boats have a hard time going around that shoal, look at shoal, the knuckle. So they get trapped on the, on the north side. And they have to wait for it to moderate to come around. And it, huh. quite a bit of the time you'll have the wind real strong from the southwest and then sometime during the night or when the front passes through, the wind shifts from the other direction. And I'm pretty sure that when I was flying that day, the wind had come around from, from the north, northeast. Yeah, there was some, mm -hmm. some other front or something. That yeah, was... the front had gone past, so mm -hmm. the wind's going the opposite way on either side of the front. Well, that's what small, you know, somebody told Dennis and I is that it looked like the wind was coming from every direction. Well, <laughs> well, there was well a, on top of that shoal, when you're around that, it, it, it would look that way mm -hmm. because it's shallow water and the waves are heaped up in all different directions. Right. Mm -hmm. right. There's a southbound current, too, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So that would have been, had been when the. That's when why the, the fish were all on that side. Yeah. You, know? you had a wind going against the current mm -hmm. tonight. Mm -hmm. From there, you don't know any of the circumstances mm -hmm. of what happened or how the rescue looked or took place or what happened to the boat to cause it to sink. I have no, no knowledge mm -hmm. of anything like that. Um, and it was just almost like another day at work for the fish spotters. Yeah. You go out and you look for fish and some boats were still out, some were at the dock and those, they were going out and their weather had changed and, mm -hmm. and I don't know why they, after lunch, the second shift, so to speak, was back working as usual. Yeah. So even even after that night, and when people knew about the Fenwick Island sinking, mm -hmm. the next morning they went out and fished just like you know. Yes. No reason day. not to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. We wind up the interview portion of our presentation where we began, with the September seventeenth, two thousand fourteen interview of Clarence Veeney and Charles Forrest. Mr. Vini was a crew member on the W.T. James, Jr., while Charles Forrest was the captain of the Fenwick Island. The session is particularly memorable for two reasons. First, despite the closeness of the Menhaden fishing community, these two men had not met prior to the night of December 7, 1968, and had not seen each other since. Secondly, during the course of the interview, it occurred to all present that Clarence Vini was most likely the individual who threw the line Captain Forrest that saved his life. First, Clarence Vini. And uh, Captain Ernest told us that the boat, the boat don't sunk up ahead of us. So y'all get ready. So we're going to try to save them men. And so, if I ain't mistaken, they said the seas was around 18 feet high that night. Anyway, 
I came on the deck, got ready. So Sunday men, men got so nervous. He said, I can't go there, I can't go. I can't go there. And I, and I told him, I said, men, come on out. And we gonna try to save these men. So I went out, me and two head of us, me and a boy from Ernest Lane down by, by him, went out, name was Stude Wallace. He went out and I said, we're going to cry and we grab some lions. All bears were floating on the water. Everything, I mean, and I looked up and the sharks, Sharks were f full of water. I mean, they were great long sharks. I guess they eight, 15 feet long. They were, they were there eating fish. Sharks? Yeah. Wow. Sharks were down. He was in them fish, man. And he, he loved fish, you know. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Captain Ernie was fighting them. He was shooting Bill back up. Ping, 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 ping. Come ahead, come back, come back. And he was riding the sea road and had that, had that big light shining on, on, on the people in the water. Mm -hmm. And some of them were, I forget the cabin was down there from Bluff Point. I think it was, was, a, was, a, was a, he was a pilot on that boat. Mm -hmm. You know, he kept hollering and said, save my son, save my son, save my son. Yeah. And we said, anyway, I thought throwing line and I said, we already got your son. We got him. The next man we got, let me show Captain Winston. Charlie Winston. Captain Charlie Winston. Yeah. He, he, he was on the water floating with a pair of yellow, yellow old skins on. Never forget it. I throw the line to him, and I'm Greg and Burn in a little grab ladder. He got the down side of the boat and had him there. See, so he was beating me. He grab, grab the ladder, grab the ladder, grab the ladder. He grabbed the ladder and we pulled him on up. Didn't have no heat, cold that night. It was cold. So we took him. When we got the men, we kept him in the engine room. That was, it was a little heat in there by the, by the engine. Grabbed him up front, the engine room. Opened the door and put him in there by the heat. And like me and a lot of them. Yeah, he helped them to come to, brought them to the census. And I'll never forget as long as I live. At night, we, we finally made it in. But we, but we, we brought some men in. I never thought we had a cut through up front. And we stacked them up, I knew about six, six or seven here. Seven of them, seven of them, same head. We stacked them up there like you stacking. People just stack pulpwood on top of one another. And I and I said if I ever you know this, I, I'm never gonna be off Carolina no more. So I made it through that that season. But I said I wasn't coming back to North Carolina no more. But I I did go back. I did go back to North Carolina and finished, I think, a couple more seasons down there. And uh, I think I gave it up. I gave it up. In the fall of 68, that's where we're getting to. They gave me a boat in Louisiana, and that's just Fenwick Island. Mm -hmm. we, we, I got a crew of men from here, and went to Fenwick Island, went on Fenwick Island to Buford, North Carolina. We were doing real good in uh and one afternoon we Saturday afternoon we started on we had all we needed at the time because we had a way to run. And we started back to the plant and the and the storm started coming up. So we were doing good. I think one of the had deck plates on them then. I think it was a chain hooked over there. Or the side of the rail and that boat and the barrel flipped down the deck, flipped on the middle and getting dark, we no one could see it. And at the meantime, we kept running, you know, and I, I was calling, calling back and forth. And he said that uh, we're getting a little worse, I bet. So 
Captain Charlie Benson, he had more experience than we all did because he had been into it a while, my second year. So we, we, we kept nudging along, but we were doing good until the, that flip that deck, deck plate, plate and the water started going in there, and that night nobody could see it. Then she started getting a list in there. Yeah. And getting this list, it kept going over, so they said, well, if we called the Coast Guard, and they said, well, they had clearance from Washington before they could get back with us. So she kept getting this big list, and then so we said, and got everybody to put on the life of there. They all put on life of there, and the seas coming, and wind roaring, then they come, Seas from come one sea will come southwest, the other one southeast, and just pile her it up. And she had so much listing, so she capsized. I can remember walking up on there, on the, the ladder that goes to the mass east, and sit on the side of me and another one of my crew member. And here come a big sea, watch this old boy. That was the last thing I knew until this Captain Ernest picked us up. I didn't know who he was. Yeah. And this boat, the nets were all board and everything, and the sea was so high. And, and this brother come up beside us, and he had lights on the deck. And somebody threw a line, we caught a line, and the boat kept rolling like that. So once she rolled, you know, and you get it down the low part, somebody took a line, and I flipped it on the deck. But I was about out then. So, all around my neck, the throat got so sore from the salt water in you know, a rough way of whipping you in the face. Then they put me in the engine room on the WT jam so the weather was warm at, and I kind of warmed up a little bit. They, they kept saying, come on, go up on top. So when they got out there, we was at the dock. So I got on the dock and then put us all in the hospital. And then uh, <coughs> I didn't, saw two, three months crew member and the rest of them went. I was heard the next day that they was floating out on the water. Mm -hmm. And that was about the extent of that trip. And uh, I put me in the hospital a day or two. I stayed in there and we come on home. I spent a run around the house there and I said, well, I reckon that would be the end of my career, you know. So, so Mr. Smith come and two or three more came and said, oh, we want you. Get yourself together, we we gonna we gonna have some for you. I said, okay. So I didn't know whether I was make it or not, but I got on that boat. I got a crew of men. And we went on went south to give me another well, boat. Well Captain Charlie, when you were when you were at home, when you find you know, when you got back home, uh, I know uh, you you've told me that you you didn't want to go to any of the funerals. No, I didn't go to them, but one, I, I said, I went to one, one, only one, they had six of them up at school, but I, I wouldn't go. I didn't feel up to it, I couldn't, uh, I figured I couldn't have had nothing to it, I just would take something from me, you know. Of course, mm -hmm. of course. Well, so after the, after the funerals and all, you know, it was Christmas time, and uh, did you, uh, that winter and Christmas and all, did you sort of stay at home a lot? Stay on, stay around the house, yeah. I got a little job I went on. I, I used to go on a job. But uh, so many of the family, you know, they would come in my house regularly, you know, oh, you can't do something, you couldn't help me, you know, to give me encouragement. Give me encouragement and say that uh, I was very dear and it against me, you know. Because we were all in the water together. So that made it better too. When you got responsibility, you look at everybody look at you, what you done did, but that could have happened to anybody that night. And uh, then uh, old Matt Smith in the spring will come in, you know, you want to go I, I, I don't know where I'm going back now. Oh, we want you, we want you. come on back, we're going to get you another rig. I said, well, I'll try it, but I don't know. It was tough though when I first went back, it really was. Because I didn't have my nerve just give it up. I guess it would be. Uh, give it up and uh, kept going, you know, kept going. I got some tough. I said, I can't make these people no money because this man did my crew member, you know. I said, I can't make money because 
Time to fish would come in all. I was getting nervous, couldn't do it. I said, get my anchor, we go in and put the anchor. Everybody will be fishing. But all that one night, every bit left me just same as this, this table was sitting here. I had no more fear. Mm-mm. No more. I don't know. I know what happened, but I didn't have no more fear. Mm-mm. You know what happened? Yep. What happened? A big God Almighty took all the fear from me. That's what I believe. And that's what I believe, because on the net, go take it. What's going to take it? And took it all the way. I mean, all, all the night fishing, some rough weather since then and all, no fear. Before then, when the sun started going down, whoo! So we went on, we done about every year. And, and caught high, saved me some million. We wound up with 140, 140, 140 million and 140,000. How many, how many million do we have now? One billion, 140 million. Wow. Yeah, sure yeah. Wow. yeah. A lot of fish. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, so a lot. a lot of fish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what year, what year did you finally retire? 95. In 95? Yeah. Okay. Well, is it, so this is the first time that you two have met since December, the night of December 7th, 1968. It's the first time I ever met him. <laughs> I never met him. Either. I well, remember pulling bull. I did the first time I ever met him. And never, I, he's just like a picture to me today. Because I've never seen him. But I know what happened that night. But I, I remember pulling bull to bull. But he, he, and most of the men was on that, on that boat with me that night. And most of them is gone. So, Clarence, did you... Did you throw Charlie the line that mm -hmm. rescued? Did, did you throw Charlie the line that saved his life? He don't yeah. know, but he said so. He didn't know me who I was. I didn't know who he was, but I, 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 threw, I, 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 I threw the line to him. Mm -hmm. I never forget it. I threw that line like that and, and got it like a ring. And I, uh, every time I threw that line, I, I, I would get him. I would get my man. Mm -hmm. I get him in there and I pull him. I pull him on board. Cause I'm I'm that little age on me now, and time time go by. Time don't wait. Yeah. Time and tide don't wait. Well, so so you so you two met, you know, once before in these horrible conditions, and uh, in the worst circumstances imaginable, and. Uh, it's, so it's it's kind of great to see you here together now, you know. Is you know is so much older and 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 and, 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 and you know your families have grown up and gone away and uh, doing well and you know y'all are doing good and so it's you know it's a real honor and privilege for me to be to be here with you guys. And, uh, it's an honor for me too. <laughs> I, 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 I. It's a privilege for me because I, I like thank him, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I know. <clears throat> so I, I, I'm after I met Cap Ernest. I don't know who I met. After the day, I'm going to send him a memory. I'm going to get his phone number so I can stay in touch with him. Yeah. yeah so it's a privilege to see him. Because that, 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 that was a terrible night. I never forget as long as I live. You no, know, so. Each person present has a slightly different perspective of exactly what happened, but each version generally seems to conform to the Coast Guard's conclusions of the events. It's been 46 years since the Fenwick Island sank. The few who were involved that are alive today are mostly in their 80s and 90s, and although the memory of detail has failed a bit, there remains a certain consistency or continuity of the major aspects of that night. There have been many changes in the world in those 46 years that affect the way we view the past. We began the oral history project at the Reedville Fisherman's Museum back in 2005 because some were concerned that the knowledge, traditions, and rich stories surrounding the Manhattan fishing industry would not be passed along to future generations and therefore lost in time. The sinking of the Fenwick Island is one such story that needed to be told. So I was I was talking to your 
great nephew in law, Troy, mm -hmm. a poor minute out there. And I just told him what we were doing and why we wanted to talk to you. So I gave him, you know, I gave him a quick little story about the Fenwick Island and, and, and those those people who drowned and and those people that you helped save. And he said he'd never heard that story. I don't guess he had he wasn't even born. Why didn't you tell him? I don't think he I don't think he was old he was dead of him. His daddy wasn't fishing at that time. Well do you ever tell do you ever tell your grandchildren and Boy. But that day, that night. Uh -huh. Sometimes I talk to him about it and sometimes I don't. Because he don't know I want to go don't know, ain't need to talk to him about it because he's not going on the water. He's not going on the we ain't going over there hooking our fishing. So, <laughs> they ain't going on no water. Oh!